All right. Uh, good afternoon. You are listening to 93.9 FM, The Worthian, serving Chesterfield and Ryko, Richmond, Goochland, and Hanover. This hour, you are listening to Stephanie Milady and Climate Watch. I'll mention at the top of the hour here that the thoughts and opinions contained in the following broadcast are those of the host and or guests and not the staff or volunteers of WRWKLPFM or the Board of Synergy excuse me, the Board of Directors of Synergy Project. And with that, we'll get to uh, the climate news. <clears throat> In case anyone is joining us for the first time or um, has only been getting their climate crisis news from commercial media outlets, brought to you typically by the major producers of greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity loss, I want to start this hour with the basic facts about climate change, uh, global heating, and uh, what they have brought to, uh, and the fact that they have brought us to the start of what is now being called a sixth mass extinction event. I think it's, um, personally, I think it's very important that we all have a good working knowledge of the factual reality of our circumstances when we encounter what passes for the news on climate change in our daily travels. So please forgive me for being a little sciencey for the next several minutes, but our climate and ecological crises are products of changes to our physical world by our so-called developed societies and the basic science needs to be understood by us if human civilization is going to survive. So let me explain. And if you are joining us, um, not on the radio, but uh, maybe possibly at face that with our Facebook live stream, you can see some of the data uh, yourselves, uh, starting with um, ourworldindata.org it's where I get a lot of the basics um, that you guys can uh, become more familiar with, hopefully, and more comfortable with as time goes by. So here are the basics. For several hundreds of thousands of years, our atmosphere has maintained a rather limited range of CO2 concentration. That's carbon dioxide in our atmosphere between a bit less than 200 parts per million and not over typically 300 parts per million. So that's... Uh, 0.02 or 0.03 percent. So that's not a big percent. That's a difference of approximately 0.01 percent. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is CO2 is a powerful greenhouse gas. And when the level has dropped closer to 200 parts per million, the planet has endured some rather frigid glacial periods. We sometimes call them ice ages, lasting for tens of thousands of years. Then when concentrations have, live in, have risen back above 250 parts per million and almost, almost never more than 300 parts per million, again, in several hundred of, hundreds of thousands of years, we've experienced the interglacial periods. Uh, that's when temperatures are more moderate because due to that increased level of CO2 in our atmosphere, that's a higher amount of greenhouse gases that means our atmosphere can hold on to more heat coming uh, coming from the sun on a regular basis, and that affords us uh, warmer temperatures. And for the past 10 or 11,000 years, we've been enjoying some of those warmer temperatures as we left the last glacial period, the last ice age, and moved into the more tolerant planetary climate uh, that we've enjoyed again for about 10 or 11,000 years. That's with CO2 concentration levels hovering around 280 parts per million. Um, we, a lot of us decided to transition from nomadic hunter-gatherer groups to settled agricultural societies. We domesticated livestock, uh, developed civilized trading systems among our neighbors and more distant relatives. And most would agree, I think, that humanity has thrived in this environment. Now. A couple hundred years ago, some of us, especially in Western Europe and uh, the middle part here of, of Northern America, we took a strong liking to digging up and burning long dead fossilized ancestral life to fuel man-made contraptions and machines to do the work that humans and animals and nature had been performing for us up to that point. Um, unfun fact, when we burn these fossils, CO2 is released into the atmosphere. About 150 years ago, here in the U.S. specifically, we started doubling our production, that is the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, every decade. 
only slowing or pausing that growth in production around the time of a few world and regional wars until the Vietnam War, when we figured out how to keep increasing our burning of fossil fuels at home while we were bombing and burning, burning other parts of the world as we waged war abroad. Even though we were only about 25% of the world's population during the last century, for the first half of that century, from about 1900 to 1950, we managed to double our consumption of fossil fuels at least four times, such that we were generating over 40% of the world's CO2 emissions being added to our atmosphere. Again, just 5% of the population responsible for 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions being added to our atmosphere due to CO2 emissions. During the third quarter of the 20, 20th century, from 1950 to about 1975, our portion of the world's CO2 production lessened as we were encouraging other countries to take up the practice of powering their lives with fossil fuels. By 1975, we were still doubling our output um, essentially each decade or so, but our percentage of the world production fell to 25%. Again, we're still just 5% of the world population, but at that point we were responsible for 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions in the form of CO2 from burning fossil fuels. By this time, the 1970s, the geoscience of what we were doing was already on full display to anyone paying attention. Atmospheric carbon parts per million had been and were being measured, and Earth scientists knew that the level had climbed from 290 parts per million about 100 years prior to 330 parts per million in 1975. And that rise in CO2 concentration had already forced a planetary mean temperature rise of about a half a degree Celsius. Because CO2, again, is a primary greenhouse gas in our atmosphere, the stuff that makes it possible for our atmosphere to retain solar energy, i.e. heat. Now, the petrochemical guys were studying the heck out of this situation then, and they realized that continued increase in the burning of these massive quantities of fossil fuels every year was going to eventually torch the future of existing planetary life. So, they did the moral ethical thing and they told the rest of the world what was going on and that they were going to throttle back on production and start developing alternate climate stabilizing fuels to power human activities. No, yeah, no, they, that's not what they did. They doubled down on dog eat dog or humans set the frat house on fire capitalism and they ramped up a disinformation campaign about the realities of their global heating products that would have made big tobacco blush if big tobacco themselves had a smidgen of ethics. And with the leverage of massive nefarious financing of their disinformation campaign and the political lobbying operations, these industries pressured our national authorities and military to invade, occupy, or make offers that most countries dare not refuse all around the globe in order to secure access and or acquisition of enough global fossils that the U.S. and European allied petroleum companies now control more than 80% of the until now very profitable world supplies. You can see more on that information at 2DegreesInvesting.org, uh, their master fossil fuel ownership report of November 2018. So the result of all that intentional development and skyrocketing increases in consumption of fossil fuel since the 70s has forced the rise in atmospheric CO2 concentrations over 410 parts per million. That's my rip the bandaid off portion of the show. Each time I have to say that, it pains me. Uh, I imagine for those of you who are frequent listeners of the broadcast, it probably is starting to hurt too, but it's got to be said and I'll keep saying it. The planet hasn't experienced this concentration level of greenhouse gases in millions of years. Not hundreds of years not hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. When I learned that, I wanted to know what the heck the planet was like when we did have 
greenhouse gas concentrations of CO2 over 400 parts per million. Turns out, previously in the geological record of our planet, when CO2 concentration levels have risen this high, on occasion, planetary life has experienced mass extinction events. Not good. Ecosystems around the globe have collapsed on land and in our oceans and fresh, fresh water reservoirs. The vast majority of plant and animal species incapable of adapting to the resulting rapid changes in climate, temperature, rainfall, oxidation levels, they perished. Entire food chains disintegrated. 75 to 95% of life went extinct. And that's why we call them mass extinction events. Scientists are now discussing our current situation as the beginning of just such an event. And as terrifying as that information should be to anyone just learning it, the more horrifying reality to me is that our so-called national leadership and major incorporated businesses and utility monopolies, those that we entrust with incredible amounts of power, authority, and responsibility to serve and protect our general welfare, they've known this for decades. What many of them didn't count on was that the impacts of our climate changing ad activities would manifest themselves as rapidly and violently as they are now, and how exponentially devastating what we've set in motion will be for all planetary life in the immediate decades ahead. As luck would have it, our big human brains and our innovative development of supercomputers capable of grinding out highly complex and amazingly more and more accurate climate models are clearly and terrifyingly informing us that we've locked in catastrophic global heating that is just as likely irrevocable irreversible now as reversible. So what are these approaching catastrophic climate changes? Well, again, if you are with it, joining us uh, on, on our Facebook live stream, uh, there are quite a number of references to what I'm about to say, uh, most likely in the, in the chat beside us uh, articles that highlight these catastrophic climate changes, uh, some of which have already gotten well underway. They include the loss of the foundation of 25% of ocean life, i.e. coral reefs all around the globe. The uh, UN IPCC's re report, uh, special report on warming of one and a half degrees Celsius said that if at one and a half degrees of warming, we'll likely lose, I think, uh, 75 to 90% of cor all coral reefs well, there's at least a, a better than 50-50 uh, chance of that happening. And if we reach two degrees of warming, pre-industrial age um, warming, uh, there's a high prob probability that we'll extinguish uh, just about all coral, coral life. Okay, so that's, that's one. There's also the likely frequent occurrences of killer heat waves in vast regions of habited lands where much of life in those areas will not be able to survive out of doors. Not just humans, but livestock, wildlife, crops, and vegetation. Sea level rise that will make coastal cities and lands unlivable. Contamination of fresh water resources by the invasion of salt water from the encroaching seas. Lingering droughts causing fresh water scarcity for entire regional ecosystems. Hundreds of millions of equatorial migrants on the move to higher latitudes because their homelands will no longer sustain them. And all that has started happening and will continue to worsen in the immediate decades because we continue to refuse to do what is necessary to stop it. And that's our current climate changing reality. And this is Climate Watch on WRWK 93.9 LP, The Work FM. Again, licensed in Midlothian, serving Chesterfield, Enrico, Richmond, Goochland, and Hanover. All right, I'm checking the clock, and I think I'm a, a little ahead of schedule. So I'm going to slow down, take a breath, and I've got some, uh, I've got some fun graphics maybe in this next section we're going to try out. Because 
I realize that I've painted a very bleak picture. And I suppose there are some of you wondering, what gives this woman the right to make such alarming announcements about what's coming our way? That's not an unreasonable question. The answer is, I'm just an average individual with the time and the access to the information that the climate science community has been courageously making available to anyone willing to face the truth, which doesn't seem to include much of our US major media news outlets and elected governments. Some of the most recently updated scientific analysis was published at the end of February um, this year by the National Center for Climate Restoration regarding the supposed budget carbon budgets for one and a half and two degrees Celsius of warming uh, that had previously been estimated by groups like the UN Inter Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And you'll find the center's uh, full reporting at breakthroughonline.org backslash briefings. According to their analysis, one and a half degrees of mean planetary temperature rise that we've been advised not to breach if we love life and our children is now likely to be reached by 2030 or earlier due to the yet unrealized heating potential of emissions to date. The current level of planetary greenhouse gases present in our biosphere has the potential for approximately two degrees of mean global temperature rise. All right, that was a little bit more sciencey talk than any of you probably deserve on a Thursday afternoon. So um, I'm going to diverge a little bit and uh, talk, try to make that stuff make sense to you with an analogy that I came up with this week. And it, um, for those of you that are only listening, I'm going to do my best to describe it to you uh, and let you picture it. And for those of you who are watching, I brought a little bit of a graphic graphic demonstration. And um, and what what I want you to think about is uh, going into your kitchen and grabbing a bowl, okay, and taking that bowl and putting it into your kitchen sink, and then starting um, a slow drip, if you will coming out of the faucet, faucet, striking the bowl, okay? And as the water drips down onto the bowl, typically what happens is uh, some of that water sticks to the bowl, right, to the, to the surface of it. Some of it might bounce off. Some of it might go rolling down the edges. Um, but a certain amount of it eventually gathers at places on the bowl, okay? But only so much of it. And then the rest of it, like I say, might bounce off uh, to either side, splash around, roll down off of the um, off of the bowl, off of, into the sink. Okay. In my analogy, uh, what we're talking about here, the faucet is the sun. Okay, and the dripping is the solar radiation that strikes our planet, and the bowl is our planet. And in this case. It's our planet when there are only 200 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, only a very limited amount of greenhouse gases. So that means that um, the bowl doesn't really have very much capability of holding on to the energy that that uh, the water, in the case of the the bowl in the sink, can't hold on to a whole lot of that um, a whole lot of that water. And in the case of our planet, can't really hold on to a whole ton of solar radiation uh, and warmth, okay? So that's our initial situation. Now, when we warm uh, our planet up to 300 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, it's kind of like uh, taking an absorbent cloth and draping it over our bowl in the sink, our earthen bowl in the sink. So. We take a nice dry absorbent cloth and we drape that over our bowl. Now the faucet continues to drip, right? It's dripping a nice little steady, steady supply drop, drop, drop of water onto the bowl, onto the now the um, cloth covering the bowl, and it has a particular absorption capability such that still some of the water might bounce off, some of the water might roll down the side. 
but a lot more of it now is being um, absorbed into that cloth. When we have 300 parts per million um, of CO2 in our atmosphere, we have the capability of capturing a lot more solar energy striking the earth, coming into our atmosphere, and holding on to that and raising our temperatures because we have more heat in our atmosphere. And so that's essentially um, what happened about 10 or 11,000 years ago with CO2 uh, levels rising. Um, I've got my graphics here and I've, I've put an extra layer onto the bowl here in the, in the form of our, uh, our newest absorbing cloth. Okay, so about 10,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, CO2 concentrations rose back up closer to 300 parts per million, actually about 280. And um, our atmosphere captured more of the solar radiation that was striking the planet. Um, eventually, like with the cloth in covering the bowl in the sink, there's only so much that that cloth can retain as well before it becomes saturated, okay? And it reaches an, reaches an equilibrium, a state of equilibrium, meaning any additional water that drip, drip, drips down onto that cloth, anything that's absorbed is gonna force out water somewhere else because it has, again, reached saturation. It's reached an equilibrium kind of state. And that's also what happened with our planet. At 280 parts, approximately 280 parts per million, our atmosphere had a, a higher level of um, absorb, uh, a higher capacity to hold on to heat, but it only had so much capacity. So the planet warmed out of the glacial period, warmed up to what it, you know, what it was about uh, 10,000 years ago, if you will, but then it became saturated and um, the planet didn't keep warming. It reached all the energy that it, the atmosphere reached all the energy that it was going to hold on a, on a constant regular basis. And then anything else that came in from the sun, because the sun keeps shining day or night, it's always out there sending us energy. Uh, that excess energy, if you will, beyond our capacity to hold on to it was released back, is released back out into space. And so we reached equilibrium here on planet earth with that uh, CO2 concentration level and have enjoyed relatively constant temperatures for about 10,000 years. Then 150 years ago or so, we got real excited about um, adding all of this, burning all these fossil fuels and adding CO2, additional CO2 to the atmosphere. And as a result of that, in um, just about just a, around a hundred year time frame, we managed to add enough CO2 to raise carbon parts per million, CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere by 40. And I've made a mess of my little of my little picture here, but I'm going to try to I'm going to try to modify it to to uh, represent what that what that means. So, in the case of our bowl in the sink, that means we took another absorbing cloth, not quite as thick or as, uh, as uh, uh, doesn't have the same capacity, if you will, of our original cloth, but we added another thin absorbing cloth to our bowl in the sink. And the water again continues to drip, 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 and it starts to absorb additional water and our, and our planet's atmosphere started absorbing additional energy. And after a, a certain amount of time, um, that additional layer was going to reach saturation, um, reach a capacity where no matter how much more water dripped down onto that cloth, uh, it was not gonna be able to hold any more than, it, than its capacity and it would have shed additional energy and we would have reached equal, equilibrium and um, a new norm, if you will. But uh, we didn't get there. We didn't get to saturation uh, of our atmosphere due to those 40 additional parts per million of CO2. And we didn't stop adding CO2 in 1975. We continued to add even more. 
And in just uh, 45 years or so, certainly less than 50 years, less than half the time that it's taken us to raise carbon parts per million by 40 parts per million, we raised carbon parts per million another 80. Um, as I mentioned, in 1975, carbon parts per million were about 330. And uh, last year, uh, with some regularity, we were registering over 410 parts per million. So that's another 80 plus parts per million that we've added to our atmosphere. So we, before we reach saturation of that initial 40 parts per million or that initial uh, absorption on our earthen bowl, we put on, if you will, two more layers. Now, this is granted oversimplified, right? Our planetary Earth climate system is very complex, but the basic math of it um, is, is a reasonable representation here. So with the addition of twice as much greenhouse gas into our atmosphere in under half the time, we essentially put two more, if you will, absorbing layers on there uh, that are going to accept more uh, energy from the constant stream coming from the sun uh, that has not reached saturation yet. So getting back to what I, uh, what I read from the reporting, um, before I, before I brought in my, uh, my graphics, uh, Katie Porter is one of my heroes. If you guys don't know who she is, she travels with a whiteboard all the time. And, um, she, she was part of the inspiration for that. But in any event, the climate reporting that we've been talking about and the statement that the current level of planetary greenhouse gases present in our bi biosphere has the potential for approximately two degrees of mean global temperature rise, meaning since we started burning fossil fuels up until today, raising our carbon parts per million to 400 and over 410 parts per million, that amount of greenhouse gas in our atmosphere affords us the opportunity to capture and hold on to enough energy from the sun to raise planetary mean temperatures by around two degrees. So, that means we don't have a carbon budget. We don't have any more carbon that we can add to the atmosphere and still not exceed one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. In their reporting, they go on to say that reaching a one and a half increase one and a half degrees of increase in global temperatures by 2030 is now more likely than not, and that the most recent climate models show that one and a half degrees by 2025 or 27 is most likely regardless of reductions in our emissions at this point. So again, just like we did not stop adding uh, emissions in 1975, the petroleum industry, those fossil fuel industries did not make the announcement that this was happening and, and commit themselves to, to helping us get off of this stuff. We didn't stop. We didn't reach um, at that point what have, you know, we would have, we would have continued to warm if in 1975 we had stopped burning fossil fuels and stopped adding additional CO2 to the atmosphere. The potential that was already there uh, would have afforded us estimates of about 0.6 to 0.75 maybe degrees of warming. We'd only reached a half a degree of warming by that time. So we had additional potential in what existed in the, in the, in the way of 330 parts per million to continue warming, okay, uh, before we would have leveled out if we had stopped adding more and raising the parts per million. But we didn't. We added more. We've, we're now up to over 410, um, and the potential now that exists due to those extra emissions is enough to raise temperatures right now that are already that have already been raised to date to 1.2 ish degrees. We all know that um, we didn't stop at a half in in 1975, and we've been continuing to warm, and we've 
already warmed the planet more than a full degree since pre-industrial times. Right now, they're saying it's about uh, 1.2-ish degrees that we've warmed it. There's still the potential for another 0.6 to 0.75 and what's in the atmosphere, taking us then to 1.8 or 1.95 degrees of warming just from what's here. And we haven't stopped burning fossil fuels. We haven't stopped. We have not reduced the amount of fossil fuels that we're burning on an annual basis um, if we've even turned the corner yet. So, yeah, that's not good. Um, quoting climate scientist Michael Mann, uh, he's been quoted as saying that the carbon budget about one and a half degrees Celsius stabilization, quote, we're already overdrawn, to put it simply. That's maybe where I should have gone, but I wanted to be a little more elaborate this week. Okay, so no scenario that has a high probability of limiting warming to below one and a half degrees Celsius during the entire 21st century exists in the credible science literature. Another example of, of trying to wrap your head around these numbers and this and the situation, the IPCC's fifth assessment report about a decade ago showed a carbon budget for one and a half degrees of warming of about 40 gigaton, 40, excuse me, 400 gigaton. That's 400 billion tons of carbon dioxide for the rest of the century to have a better than 60% chance um, of not exceeding one and a half degrees. So the IPCC uh, a decade ago said we've got about 400 gigatons of this stuff that we can add. We can keep burning a certain amount of fossil fuels, not more than that equivalency in, in generation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions this century, and maybe we've got a two-thirds chance of a holding global warming to one and a half degrees uh, Celsius. So, of course, we, you know, uh, uh, took a nosedive on our carbon input into the atmosphere and, um, you know, got on track for that. No, I mean, I'm not telling you the truth again. What we did was in less than 10 years, we pumped that amount of emissions into the atmosphere, which means we drained the last of that carbon, supposed carbon budget last year. We are now running at a deficit for holding global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, even using those numbers, which again, the climate modeling has improved in a decade. Um, we're taking more things into consideration that need to be considered. And the uh, the modeling now says that that wasn't, that was an overestimation even at that time. And, um, and we did what we did. So one other uh, aspect of our very complex climate situation here on planet Earth uh, involves what they call aerosol, aerosol masking. I've mentioned this before but it's been a while, so let's let's talk just a little bit about that. In this case, the authors are talking about the white reflective aerosol particles released in our atmosphere during the burning of fossil fuels that actually aids in reflecting some solar energy back into space. That's part of what, what's considered the albedo effect, if you will, a lot like those big um, white reflective ice sheets at the poles. Um, the albedo effect means the energy and the light strikes it and um, reflects it back up into space, back in the atmosphere, hopefully back up into space, rather than being absorbed by darker uh, lands and water surfaces. Uh, that's the albedo effect. Um, these particles that are emitted during the burning of fossil fuels, um, there's a lot of them too, like the CO2. But in the case of CO2, once we put that in the atmosphere, it has a tendency to stick around for decades, if not hundreds of years. But these aerosol particles don't. They can be dissipated relatively quickly. So these short-lived atmospheric particles will be quickly eliminated when we stop burning massive quantities of fossil fuels, which we must. And current, current mean global temperature increase of one point, approximately 1.2 degrees Celsius right now could be quickly increased by another half of degree due to the masking that's happening from these particles. Again, these particles are uh, forced up into our atmosphere 
solar energy comes down into our atmosphere, strikes these particles, and is immediately reflected back out. So they don't have the chance to come all the way into the, in through the atmosphere, strike the planet, potentially hit uh, nice warm surfaces, um, darker surfaces, land and waters, and be absorbed. These, these particles to date have kind of helped us keep things a little cooler. Those are gonna go away when we stop burning fossil fuels and that potential warming that is now going to be allowed through the scientists are estimating is about another half degree. So as fossil fuel use declines, as it must, so will the aerosol cooling. So that for the next two decades or so, they estimate lower emissions will not lessen the warming trend. We're going to cut our emissions, hopefully. We're gonna stop burning this fossil, these fossil fuels, but these particles are gonna go away, which means we're going to be exposed to more warming, not less. The Earth has already passed some climate system tipping points, and we're dangerously close to others, including polar, major polar ice sheet melts, permafrost lost, boreal forests, and the Amazon forest conversion from carbon sinks to sources, which could trigger irreversible self-sustaining warming, or the hothouse Earth scenario. Again, something that we've talked about. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into that today, but you guys can study up on it um, if you want to visit the uh, proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences or PNAS.org, their trajectories. Oh, what did they call that paper? I almost had the title memorized for a little while. Traje trajectories of the Earth system in the Anthropocene. Yeah, some, some heady stuff. Uh, but they give it to you straight and they tell you um, in language that this average person could understand, so you can understand as well, and that is that um, it, after a certain amount of warming of these various regions of our planet, um, they hold their own, some of them hold their own potential to become carbon sources, if you will, like permafrost that has to date been uh, safely locked for tens of thousands of years under ice and snow. And with the melting of all that ice and snow, all of that organic matter uh, with its own potential to release carbon into the air, uh, carbon dioxide and, and as well as methane, it, the doors are now opening. And uh, it's estimated that there's two to three times as many uh, potential emissions in these areas than what we, mankind, have put to date into the atmosphere. So as we stop putting emissions in the atmosphere and we start hopefully taking out what we have put in, um, it's going to be working against us in that it's going to be generating its own, um, nature is going to be generating its own emissions and potentially uh, see the collapse of carbon sinks that have, have been helping us try to get this stuff out of the air, like the Amazon forest, like our boreal forests, um, they're, they're going to become sources themselves. So that's catastrophic. That we need to avoid. Global temperature rise is on track for at least three degrees by 2100 with stated policies to date. You should know that. The Paris Agreement, um, any of these other kinds of uh, past understandings of, of what efforts might, might glean um, that we're not even meeting, but we said we would do, still mean three degrees of warming. That's not that's not uh, groundbreaking news, but it is still the case. So you guys should be aware of that. In summary, uh, the report summary, they state that the world is likely entering a period of accelerated heating and reducing emissions will have little or no effect on that trend for the next 20 to 25 years. The eminence of further tipping points makes this situation potentially catastrophic. It is their position that the world needs to be at net zero emissions by 2030 for the two degree target to be achieved. And they conclude that this is possible with massive political will, massive global investments, please no crazy geoengineering schemes. I'm editorializing their statement obviously at this point and um, major restoration of natural carbon sinks. The earth energy imbalance, as I mentioned, it, and they mentioned one more time is still right now 0.6 to 0.75 degrees 
Celsius of additional warming. Adding that to 1.2 degrees of warming so far means an expected warming of 1.8 to 1.95, just below 2 degrees for the current level of greenhouse gases that we have, and we are adding more daily. So anticipate that number getting above 2 pretty darn soon at the rate that we're moving uh, in the wrong direction. Putting all of that in very measured, polite society speak, the IPCC carbon budgets overestimate the carbon budget and are not a reliable foundation for policymaking. Anybody right now still referencing those carbon budgets and telling you that we have a carbon budget remaining, um, please stop them. Uh, please update them especially if they serve in a decision-making capacity and bring them the new information, the updated information, uh, the, the actual science on our situation. Okay, so in summary, climate change is an existential threat to human civilization, that is to contemporary developed society. Precautionary action must be taken to ensure that tipping points with catastrophic outcomes are not triggered. And this emphasizes the importance of reaching net zero emissions by 2030, not 2040, not 2050, not 2060, not cutting emissions in half. Reaching net zero emissions by 2030. Arguably, some of us think we ought to be even more... Uh, cautionary and shoot for 2025. Now, as your intellect, your psyche begins to digest all that, I ima imagine that your basic survival and emotional response might be, geez, lady, what am I supposed to do with all that? Panic. As Greta would say, I want you to panic. And I want you to panic like Greta with action. There's, believe it or not, there is a great little flip book at climaterealitycheck.net backslash flip book with many of these not so fun facts that I have covered um, here in this hour that I recommend everyone have a look at. Share it with your friends and your acquaintances and everyone you meet and keep having the discussions about our current situation, which is a crisis, because the lack of understanding of the climate crisis here in the U.S. especially is a make or break issue for human civilization at this point. I also recommend that you channel your outrage like the members of Extinction Rebellion and go into rebellion against your own extinction and that of your children and demand that our authorities and elected officials inform the general population of just how freakingly dangerous our situation is right now. You should not be getting, let's be clear, you should not be getting this information from me. This is something that every elected official should be stating on the record in public to their constituents on a regular basis. Major news media outlets should be reporting on this every single day. It should be in the front of our awareness at all times as we go through our daily lives and make decisions about how to do that. Because we need to get to work on mitigating the climate disrupting damages that could destroy human civilization, which is a demure way of saying, let's not invite mass starvation, disease, depravity, and unchecked violence, not unlike what is playing out in Syria, Yemen, Central America, and other pockets of human society where climate changing human activity has already forced populations into very desperate conditions. Now, just in case anyone's thinking, well, shoot, game over. There's no way our federal government or our state governments are going to enact big system system altering changes in a short period of time. Well, here's the hopeful part. You can chew on this for a minute. In 1971, proposed the proposed 26th Amendment reducing the right to vote from 21 to 18 years of age passed in Congress. Both the House and the Senate passed the proposed amendment and sent it, sent it to the states for ratification. 
It was ratified by the states in just three months and eight days. That's the quickest time for any amendment. The 26th Amendment became part of the Constitution on July 1st of 1979, but we didn't accomplish this monumental feat with letter-writing campaigns and the election of progressive state and federal legislatures. People in this country took to the streets and other public spaces in mass, and they committed acts of nonviolent civil disobedience that grabbed the attention of the nation at large, raising the injustice of the issue which was primarily the drafting of our young at the age of 18 and sending them halfway around the world to make war, to kill and be killed in an action decided by leadership that they'd had no voice, no say in electing because they had no vote. So they demanded that right to vote in the midst of a life and death situation and they got it. First, actually, it came in U.S. congressional legislation. Uh, which proved constitutionally questionable to some. So a constitutional amendment was enacted the very next year. Within the next four years, the broader anti-war movement forced the defunding of the decade-long military campaign and brought an end to massive U.S. military war crimes in Vietnam. If you'd like to learn more about the effectiveness of mass nonviolent civil disobedience, I highly recommend checking out the work of Erica Chenoweth. That's something that the uh, Extinction Rebellion, the folks at Extinction Rebellion took a good hard look at and uh, it, um, it impacted their strategies uh, that have worked uh, quite successfully in the last couple of years. There's an excellent hour long talk by the research author on YouTube um, that she gave early last year at Wellesley College that updated her research from, um, from earlier in the decade that's, that's worthwhile. And again, uh, you are listening to Climate Watch on WRWK 93.9 LP, The Work FM, licensed in Midlothian, serving Chesterfield, Enrico, Richmond, Goochland, and Hanover. My apologies if I start to talk a little too fast. I just looked at the clock, and I think I'm running a little bit behind on time. Um, but in appreciation of WRWK and Ron Skinner especially, who is always uh encouraging me to make these weekly broadcasts on community radio uh, local, uh, effective here at the local level. I try to take a few minutes each week to highlight local climate crisis information and actions here in the greater Richmond area. And this week, I want to mention quite a few of them. Uh, the Sierra Club, of which there is a local chapter in Richmond. They have an upcoming uh, nationwide day of action on March 31st. I just received an email from them. Uh, it goes something like this. Congress will soon be considering a massive economic stimulus package that could be the largest investment in clean energy and transportation in U.S. history. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make sure this legislation is as bold as possible and that is firmly rooted in justice. And that's why on March 31st, Sierra Club will be holding a national day of action to call on our members of Congress and the Biden-Harris administration to support the Thrive Act, a bold new plan from the Green New Deal Network to create 15 million good jobs, counteract racial injustice, and fight the climate crisis. So they encourage everyone to make sure our leaders hear from us, and you can even sign up to host or, or possibly attend an action party on March 31st to push that Thrive Act, check in with Sierra Club to find out more. I also received an update from generation180.org. Uh, they sent a quick summary of the uh, electric vehicle bills that passed in Virginia this General Assembly session and what they will do, um, starting with the advanced clean car standards, which will require manufacturers to send more electric vehicles to Virginia auto dealers can't buy them if you don't have them. Um, also affordability for electric vehicles, the EV rebate program will reduce the upfront price of new and used electric vehicles by up to $2,500 or even more for low and moderate income buyers. We talked a little bit about that during uh, proceeding and during the General Assembly that did pass. So um, as you convert your personal travel, your personal transfer transportation 
from combustible engines to um, electric offerings. Um, Virginia would like to help you with that. EV buses for schools, the EV grant program fund and program creates a new fund which can receive federal and philanthropic dollars and use them to help schools replace diesel buses with electric ones. So if you got a lot of money lying around and you wanna pitch that in, uh, apparently they'll take it um, and we can get our kids off of these stinky diesel school buses, as I imagine my grandchildren calling them and onto electric ones real soon. EV chargers, the EV charging infrastructure bill, I uh, just moved my place again. The EV charging um, infrastructure bill directs Virginia's Public Utility Commission to consider transportation electric electrification pro policies and ensure better access to charging stations across the state. Uh, they actually call for us to study this in support of the 2045 net zero carbon target, which I hope by the end of this hour you realize is way too late and needs also to be amended uh, to something closer to 2030, if not 2025. So they're going to need to study that really fast and get that plan in action and get those, um, those charging stations out there now. But in the meantime, they have started, uh, they have passed some legislation to get us started on that path. From Drive Electric RVA, a very local organization here. This coming Saturday, March the 27th at 9 a.m., they'll have uh, EVs on display at the Colonial Heights Farmer's Market. You can bring your car or your questions or both, and they'll be ready to connect with you. You can find out more at their Facebook page, um, and they'll also have an electrics and espresso car meet on Sunday, March the 28th at 2 p.m. That one's actually going to be virtual using interactive Topia, Topia, Topia platform. I haven't used that one myself. And Zoom. Uh, I'm an old person. And if you hadn't figured that out yet, struggling with these, these high tech things on occasion. But uh, their hope is that if COVID-19 infection rates continue to fall and vaccination rates continue to rise here in the Richmond area, they'll be uh, meeting again in person like they used to do in the good old days, maybe as, even as soon as April. And you can find out more about their events at driveelectricrva.com EV car meet. Um, also, Coming up very soon, uh, the guys were telling me this is going to be next Thursday, April 1st, will be the Sacred Stone Camp's uh, five-year anniversary. On that date, uh, thousands of people have protested to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, and the fight has been ongoing ever since. Last month alone, Standing Rock Sioux and Cheyenne River Sioux youth ran 93 miles to the site of the original resistance to pressure where raise awareness and pressure uh, President Biden to shut down the oil pipeline. Now they are coming to D.C. to demand that the president, quote, build back fossil free by revoking the Army, Car the Army Corps' permit for Line 3 and shutting down DAPL, which I believe is currently, um, yeah, is currently uh, operating illegally because I think the courts have, have told them that they need to do as much and... Um, for some reason that hasn't happened yet. So more awareness, uh, more demands. Also on April 10th, you can join a webinar to learn how you can keep fighting pipelines nationwide. You can get uh, both both of those um, events, the April 1st and April 10th uh, are being organized or, or CCAN is assisting in their organization. Uh, CCAN is the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. If you guys haven't heard that acronym before, uh, follow them, get on their mailing list. They do some some excellent direct action and you can learn more, more details and RSVP for a couple of those events. So if I don't have you in full, revo um, full rebellion yet and you're not out on the streets locking yourselves to bank doors and government doors and I don't know any of those other kind of clever things that Extinction Rebellion and, and many direct action uh, organizations are coming up with to get in the way of um, burning down our children's future. Those are some other things that you could do. Okay, and so uh, that is going to do it for the information that I had for you all this week. I um, hope you have a safe week. 
I hope you keep wearing your masks. I hope more and more of you are getting vaccinated when it is your turn so that we can get together again uh, and enjoy enjoy life. Um, I know I, I bring you guys some pretty heavy stuff each week. I bring you not, not usually the most hopeful information or the most cheerful information. That's just me, okay? These organizations that I sometimes mention and talk about, um, they've got a lot of more cheerful people in them. So you should get in touch with them and you should add your voice and your resources and your talents to their efforts because they do some amazing, amazing things, very clever things, very uh, and um, joyful and effective. Um, so get to their websites. If you can't get to them in person right now, find out more, learn how you can get involved, learn how you can make those impacts um, in your own daily lives when it comes to decarbonization. Consider some of these things that, um, at least here in the state of Virginia, they're trying to help you with uh, converting your transportation. Um, I did not mention much about power generation this week, but for those uh, of you that have gotten completely panicked and you really want to get a solar array for your property or your neighborhood, I recommend you get in touch with the Solar United Neighbors, United Solar Neighbors one of those combinations, um, check them. They've got great resources online to get you started. Phone numbers you can call, talk to real people as well, and they can get you um, on that path as well. It's going to take all of us doing everything everywhere um, to keep ourselves under that two degrees of warming in the next few decades. And if we get really, really good at it and we manage to go negative, maybe we can get back to one and a half um, degrees of warming before we trip trip into the hot house earth uh, scenario. And there I go, getting dark on you guys again. So um, keep the light on, uh, get it powered by renewable energy. Keep talking about this with your communities. Thanks for listening to us. Uh, coming up next is Democracy Now! with my hero, uh, Amy Goodman. She has more news that you need. I hope you guys have a safe week and can join us again next week. Call us up. Let us know what you're doing. Uh, let us know how we can help you in your efforts. Let us know how we can answer your questions on these big issues. And, uh, and we'll, let's get this done. Thanks so much.